Welcome all of you risk takers, truth seekers to podcast Live the Battlefield. Today we're going to talk about Tokyo Spying Ring and his leader, gentleman called Richard Soj. The drama is happening in the 1930s and 1940s and Richard Soj was a one of the very few human intelligence operatives who got recognition. On that topic, I'd like to share something with you. From my personal experience, somebody who spent substantial amount of time working in military and diplomatic security intelligence services, I can tell you with 100% accuracy, most of the time, the people who work in clandestine services, we're talking about human intelligence, they don't get recognition from their own governments. If they get, it's a very quiet, Nobody sees the daylight, no newspapers, no the big titles, nothing. You are just there to do your job and you need to do your job very well because some instances your government is going to betray you, will not trust you. Like in case of Richard Soj. And most importantly, Richard Soj, he got recognition. Little bit too late, but he got it. So let's go dig deep into this conversation about Tokyo spying ring and what you can learn from this one. I have no doubt there's a many documentaries and movies about Richard Soj, but who he truly was. Don't forget that during 1930s and 1940s, a Soviet spy of German ancestry established a highly successful spy group in Japan. The Soviet authorities ignored Richard Soj, warning that the German invasion was unavoidable in 1941. And that invasion was called Operation Barbarossa, started on 22nd of June 1941. But that's why following the attack, they relied on his words and advised a defense strategy based on them. I must say that very few spies have had as much success as a Richard Soj. From 1933 until his capture by Japanese authorities in 1941, the fearsome Soviet agent infiltrated the German embassy and the top levels of Japanese government, giving Stalin administration with the key intelligence that literally changed the direction of the World War II. Now, let's go dig deep into his biography. Richard Soj was born 1895 in Baku, which was then part of the Russian Empire. His mother was a Russian and his father was a German. His family moved to Germany a few years after his birth, where he grew up in the very aristocratic circle of German society. He entered the German army before the First World War began in 1914. I was given the Iron Cross for his actions. After being demobilized because of an injury, he became acquainted with a who else, Karl Marx works and become a socialist, which after First World War, many country was going to that turmoil. Communism, socialism, democracy, people fought. In 1990, he completed his PhD and joined the German Communist Party. And over the next few years, Sorge was frequently involved in left-wing activism, communist and socialist. What he done then was he went in Moscow in 1924 after attracting the notice of authorities, where he worked for Vladimir Lenin Comitant before eventually joining the GRU. Now. Let's go talk about this GRU for the moment. As you know, GRU is a Russian or Soviet Union known military intelligence agency. They are established in 1917 and they still today they're known as a GRU, even they lost letter R. Many people across the Europe, across the globe, went into Moscow looking for that golden ticket to be noticed and learn about communism, socialism, to become the 
party members and list goes on. One thing many people forgot, that Russia was very good in recruiting people from foreign countries, and they will join them into GRU or any type of intelligence services, when eventually after they go into school and learn that communism, because in communism, you don't learn just a communist uh, manifesto, but you learn as well how to become either informant or you being on a payroll and being active member of GRU. Soj first surfaced as a military intelligence agent in China in the early 1930s. But at that stage, he already had a reputation. He's a womanizer at that time. And uh, they were saying that Soj was attractive and charming. Women couldn't stand up to him. And men, what else? <laughs> they admire him. But he was in China already as a part of GRU, so military intelligence operative on behalf of the Russia. After Japan conquered Manchuria in 1932, Moscow became concerned about Japanese plans for the Soviet Far East. Though Soj was tasked with establishing a network of operatives in Japan to gather as much information as possible on Tokyo intentions towards Soviet Union. And there was a war, as you know, the Russian-Japanese war. Soj was assigned to Japan as a correspondent, nevertheless, by a German newspaper editor. His name was Colonel, Colonel Eugen Otto, the German military attaché in Tokyo. <laughs> even received a cover letter from him. So that's how he got a job. It turned out to be ideal disguise for Soj. Otto, who would later become the German ambassador to Japan, unintentionally assisted, assisted Soj, I apologize. He's unintentionally assisted Soj in establishing an agency in Tokyo and become one of his most reliable informants for the following four years. Think about this one. Somebody who gives him cover letter becomes the ambassador. Obviously, he befriended Soj without knowing, without believing, without any warning, he becomes informant to Soj. That's the highlight of espionage. That's the art of human intelligence. He was a member of the so-called Soj Ring, along with Max Clausen, Ozaki Hotsumi, Miyagi Okota, and uh, Yugoslavian writer Branko Vukelic. Vukelic was working as a special correspondent for the French daily Havas and Belgrade-based Politica. You'll be surprised. Vukelic was another one spy. We can talk about him a little bit later. Soj lived an extravagant life for a spy. Absolutely. We're talking about 1930s. An extravaganza day was a different than today. He was a heavy drinker and serial womanizer who was frequently spotted driving around Tokyo on his motorcycle, bar hopping with the other journalists, and covering with a seemingly never ending parade of lovers. So he was always heavy woman. Despite living just a few streets away from, guess what, office of the Tokubetsu Kata Keisatsu a notorious Japanese police force charged with the controlling political groups and quelling the spread of dangerous foreign ideologies. His antics deflected suspicion from his work as a secret agent, allowing him to work unmolested for seven years. Now, you living so close to somebody who is against foreigners, can you imagine what opinion Japanese police, that special police, had opinion about him. Womanizer, drinker, you know, he's a journalist, leave him alone. They maybe even, I don't know, maybe they recruited him for some job, but he was not being molested by that secret police. Soj resided at that police station in Tokyo and was frequently spotted making intoxicated noises in public areas while surrounded by ladies. <laughs> Can you imagine that there is those? Some historians believe Soj had a sexual relationship with, who else? 
with Jürgen Otto's wife, the same guy who got his job and become later on ambassador. According to certain sources, the German ambassador witnessed all of this. <laughs> he witnessed it since Otto was assisting him in better understanding the Japanese political environment. Soj became aware of the German-Japanese negotiations opposing the anti-committent pact, which were aimed squarely at the Soviet Union. And don't forget, in the 1930s, everybody was positioning themselves for the Second World War, German and Japan mostly. It was one of his first successful intelligence missions in Japan. Then, in 1939, he warned of Japan's efforts to persuade Germany to create anti-Soviet military alliance, causing Joseph Stalin to strengthen negotiation with Berlin, culminating into Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, pact of will not attack each other. The move effectively blocked Japan's ambitions to attack the Soviet Union alongside Germany, forcing the Russians to fight on two fronts. So that was his first big job. Soj foresaw a German invasion on the Soviet Union as early as December 1940. That was it. The Germany invaded Russia six months later, 1941. Stalin opted to ignore those warnings, labeling soldier freak who reopened Japan factories and brothels. That's how the Stalin saw his number one spy in Japan. Freak who reopened Japan's factories and brothels. However, as soon as the attack began, Stalin's attitude toward the top intelligence officers shifted. If Japan had launched an attack on Soviet Far East, at the same time as Germany launched the offensive on the European front, the results would have been disastrous. But Japan opted not so. Japan, on the other hand, was at war with China and had to choose between attacking the Soviet Union or attacking everybody else, French, British and Dutch territories in Asia because they needed raw material. Needless to say, in December 1940, 41, they attacked Americans as well. Soj's source for information on Japan was Ozaki Hotsumi, a respected Asahi Chimbun, correspondent and communist sympathizer. But Ozaki worked as a cabinet consultant for Prime Minister Konoe Fumimaro for a period, maintaining close touch with the members of the Premier in a circle and gaining access to, what well, less, confidential material, which he then passed it to Soj. Soj advised Moscow that Tokyo would concentrate its efforts on the southern front and invade Russia only, only if the Red Army was destroyed fast in the fight against Nazi Germany. That's a very interesting statement. The master of espionage persuaded Otto to confirm the information that Germany had not persuaded Japan to launch an immediate attack on the Soviet Union. Can you imagine that conversation? Based on these figures, the Soviet Union sent 15 infantry at three cavalry divisions, 1,700 tanks and 1,500 aircraft from the Russia Far East to European Front in November 1941. And that battle for the Moscow, it was an example where the Germans broke their teeth and they need to withdraw hundreds of kilometers back. Soj secret radio signals were encrypted using one-time key, a Soviet encryption technique and looked like a abracadabra to the Japanese secret police. Nonetheless, Soj was suspected. You must understand that's one thing how the intelligence uh, services work. There's no difference between then and now because you are the white man in far east country, Japan. And secret police listen everything and they're listening most of the time when you don't think they don't listen. And of course they're gonna connect some dots. Somebody must be the suspect. Particularly when you see that some signals has been sent or received in the 
manner that you can understand straight away, there must be forens. That means the soldier was suspected. Now, soldier was apprehended when a Gestapo officers from the German embassy was dispatched to follow him. So the Gestapo sent his men to follow Soj. According to some reports, the seamstress who was recruited by the low-level agent Ozaki, she betrayed Soj, operatives when she was caught. Again, women. In October 1941, Richard Soj was arrested. So what he did? He decided to assist with the authorities in exchange for them not arresting his sweetheart, Hanako Ishii, and the wives of his colleagues. He loved women, even he's been betrayed by women. Surprise, surprise, that was accepted by the Japanese. After three years in prison, the Japanese authorities offered Soj in trade for a Japanese prisoner in USSR. But the Soviets denied knowing him. <laughs> Now, that's very interesting, right? You are not ours anymore. We don't know you. His return to the Soviet Union would annoy Stalin, who had rejected Soj's warnings that Germany was ready to attack. Now, in 1944, Soj and Ozaki were executed. So, didn't his warlord Stalin profit from his information? Yes, he did. But when it was a time to exchange, I don't know you, because credit is mine, No, some guy who loved the women in Japan. And this is the interesting thing. Soj has been recognized, but not under the Stalin, but under Nikita Khrushchev, presidency in the 1960s. The Kremlin uncovered the spy's narrative, declared him a hero, and honored him with the status and other honors. Soj did not appear to like his life of intrigue. He often lamented that if he had lived in more calm times, he would have been a scholar. But his covert activities helped shape the conclusion of the World War II and the trajectory of the modern history. Ladies and gentlemen, Soj, the womanizer, but yet the top spy for the Russians, till 1941. Stalin didn't want him and rid of him. He's executed. 20 years later, he's been recognized by a different president of the United uh, Soviet uh, Republics. So USSR recognized him then. Let me know what do you think about Soj and what do you think about spies? Generally, as a spies being recognized, should be recognized publicly should be given credit for what they do and how they do. Because don't forget one thing. There was a gentleman called Ian Fleming. The guy never saw the war, never active war. He was a part of an intelligence agency in, a, uh, in a England, United Kingdom. But yes, later on, he's got recognition as a master spy and he created 007. Thank you for watching Life the Butterfly with Mario. Feel free to subscribe, share, like, and comment. Soj. Richard Soj. Women love him. He's betrayed by women. He begged for women not to be executed. Thank you for watching.